Hi, everyone. Thank you for attending our webinar. The presentation is being brought to you by the Society of California Archivist Education Committee. My name is Christine Kim, and my co-hosts are Michelle Paquette and Marlena Christensen. Thank you for joining us for our ongoing series of web-based webinars, workshops, and training sessions offered through SCA. Today's session will be focusing on archive space and Airtable for improved workflow management. I'd like to introduce our presenters. Weatherly Stephen is the head of archival collections management at NYU Libraries, a department responsible for preparing archival collections for research and long-term preservation. She also teaches archival description in the NYU Archives and Public History program. Previously, Weatherly was the librarian for archival arrangement and description at NYU and worked in processing positions at the New York Public Library's Archives Unit and the Brooklyn Historical Society. Rachel Searcy is the accessioning archivist and primary archive space administrator at NYU Libraries, working in the archival collections management department. Previously, Rachel held positions focused on processing, metadata, and digitization at NYU's Tamament Library and Robert F. Wagner Labor Archive and the John F. Kennedy Presidential Library and Museum. Before we get started, we have a few housekeeping points. During the presentation, we are going to mute your lines. If you have questions along the way, please send them through the questions box to all participants. We'll collect these for a Q&A session with the presenters at the end of the presentation. We will be recording today's session and we'll be circulating a link to all of you after today. So let's get started. Hi everyone, it's Weatherly. And, and Rachel. <laughs> thanks for joining us. Um, we're really excited to be speaking to you all about um, Airtable, which is a system we really like. And we are um, very grateful to the Society of California Archivists for asking us to participate in their education program, as well as to all of you for attending. Um, so yes, yeah, you have been introduced to us. So um, today we're going to be talking about the ways that we use Airtable to manage our operational work generally, um, and that also includes the analysis and tracking of that work and communicating the status of uh, those assignments in each area. Um, we're going to be talking about activities that cross multiple areas of our department, so accessioning and processing and also cataloging. Um, we're going to talk about how we use Airtable to monitor our backlogs. Um, both including our working backlogs for accessioning and web archiving, as well as what most people think of in archives when talking about backlogs, um, the collections we have that are currently unavailable or under, undiscoverable to researchers, um, as well as talking about how we use it to prioritize the work that we do and gather statistics on what we've accomplished. Um, we do want to make an explicit note at the front to say that this is not an integration of Airtable into ArchivesSpace. Um, the systems don't connect and we don't intend them to do so. Um, and we'll be, but we will be talking about where we do work in ArchivesSpace, but we probably won't be focusing on that as much as we imagine that the mechanics of how to create records in ArchivesSpace um, are probably known to a lot of the attendees. Um, and I, we did want to also mention that our presentation um, includes some screen recordings. Uh, we did try and paste them so that uh, people could observe them. But um, like Christine mentioned, the webinar is being recorded. So if you want to rewatch those, you can do that. Um, so this is Weatherly again, and I just want to introduce you to what we do in our department at NYU called Archival Collections Management. Um, our department was established at NYU Libraries in 2015, and Rachel and I were both the first people in our positions. Uh, when we started, we had a few important mandates, namely to establish robust accessioning and processing programs, and to standardize practices across what were once three disparate repositories um, with a lot of staff duplicating efforts. 
So um, while we were establishing our programs and writing new workflows, we did borrow certain strategies from um, agile project management, like taking an iterative approach, um, flexible response to change, and continuous improvement. We also look at, at Kanban, but ultimately we don't subscribe to any one type of project management style. Um, instead, we really took the opportunity at the start to map out what data was important to us to track um, consistently for assignments and annual reports, and then we adapted tools as needed. So one of those tools that we used for about three years were um, multiple Google Sheets that we uh, managed the accessioning, arrangement and description, cataloging, and offsite workflows with. And around this time last year, we were ready to move to a much more robust system. Um, we found that the Google Sheets introduced a lot of human error and usability problems. And um, that is when we found Airtable. So Airtable is a cloud-based relational database that has a spreadsheet interface. And it is both desktop and mobile accessible. Um, and we chose it for a few different reasons. Um, a lot of people consider it a good project management tool, but ultimately we selected it for the ability to import and manage uh, large amounts of data about our collections. So um, just to give you a sense of the scale that we're working with, uh, we have approximately 3,000 archival collections that we manage. And in a given year, we acquire anywhere from um, 1,500 to 3,500 linear feet, and uh, between 12 and 60 terabytes of new archival material. Um, and the bulk of that, those accretion, those are accretions to existing collections. Um, and also to give you a little bit of context, a few years ago, NYU stopped supporting uh, networked database products like Microsoft Access. So uh, we were looking for alternatives and um, some of the suggestions that we received, like working directly in MySQL had um, some serious drawbacks. Um, so like we said, Airtable is a relational database and we like that because it allows us to establish one-to-many relationships between an archival collection and multiple cycles of work on that collection. So for example, um, a collection can be accessioned, processed, cataloged, and sent off site. And all of those activities are linked to that same record um, and managed through that same system. And that same functionality um, also enables one to many relationships for individual archivists and their accessioning and processing assignments. Um, so it's, it's really this relational nature that sets, its apart, set, sets it apart from um, other project and workflow management tools like Asana, Jira, or Pivotal Tracker um, that we've found to be better suited towards um, discrete projects, personal task management, or um, just independent tasks. Um, it also has a number of attractive features. Um, it allows collaborative work on records, uh, different levels of permission, different ways to filter records, linking records rather than retyping or cutting and pasting information and creating forms for our colleagues to submit information about our collections that feed into our queues again eliminating that need to cut and paste um, it does have some risks so we wanted to uh, call those out uh, airtable is independently owned and funded through venture capitalism um, while we aren't using it like a collection management system, we're also not putting uh, private or sensitive information in there other than our employee names. Um, and we're conscientious about uh, downloading a backup of our base regularly. There are free and paid versions. Uh, the free version has limits on storage, certain features, and the number of records that you can have. We use a paid version, uh, it's called the Pro Plan, and we have a nonprofit discount. Um, but we have uh, observed that other units in our library um, have run into blockers getting approval for that paid version. Um, so along with the permission levels and that collaborative nature comes the risk of people accidentally overriding or deleting important data. Um, while Airtable does preserve some history and allows for recovery through a, a trash can feature, um, it is important to be careful with your permissions, uh, provide training, 
and to lock important views so that they can't be permanently altered. So that collaborative nature um, runs both ways. So I just want to give um, a few shout outs to the places where we learned about Airtable. Um, in the last issue of the journal, Practical Technology for Archives, Catherine Dirk and Jessica Maddox of the University of Nevada at Reno um, had an article about how um, they used Airtable to collect data about a collection-wide survey, to document new acquisitions, and then also to submit name authority records to their metadata and cataloging department for MAKO consideration. Um, at NYU, our colleagues in the preservation department of the library had also used it in 2016 and 2017 to track um, collection materials that were being sent to um, art storage offsite. And here you just have a little screenshot of the form that they used to um, collect information. It allowed them to, Airtable allowed them to take pictures on their phones of different artwork around the library and record data. And then we could go back um, and beef up the records as needed. Um, our metadata librarian, Alex Provo at NYU, she also uses Airtable for digital collections publishing workflows. And she's looking into external metadata submissions um, that she can take in from an Airtable form for special projects. So there's a lot of different uses of the system um, is all I'm trying to say. And we use it for something pretty specific. So the title of this webinar <laughs> is Archive Space and Airtable. So now we're gonna talk about Archive Space. Um, we at NYU implemented Archive Space in 2016 as our system of record and primary collection management system for archival collections across NYU. And before that, we had been using Archivist Toolkit. So we use Archive Space to carry out the activities of accessioning and arrangement and description. Um, so this is where we create accession records and resource records. Um, it's where we record locations data about all of our collections. Um, and we also use it to produce access tools like finding aids and mark records. So just to clarify, we're creating these records in archive space, not in Airtable. Um, from the time of our migration into archive space, we looked at it truly as a collection management system and not a project management or workflow management system. Um, but the collection management subrecord and some of the reporting functions in archive space just don't work for our purposes um, for assignment tracking. We found difficulty with recording really granular information about our backlog, um, like distinguishing unprocessed from processed parts of collections. And we also haven't found a good way to generate reports on the collection management subrecords, which would allow us to both determine the size of the backlog at a any given time or refine that size um, after regular accessioning and processing work. We also found that we're not able to record on the individual collection level or across holdings um, granular information about the changes that take place to a, on a collection uh, during work assignments. So, and you'll see this in our slides, um, we record the difference and extent in a collection both pre and post processing um, the amount of time that certain workflow steps take, like surveying and writing a processing plan, and what parts of the workflow still need to be completed. Um, these pieces of information just weren't uh, sensible to include in archive space, and where they are, they're not repeatable or searchable for us. So these are all of the things that we manage in Airtable. So uh, we manage our operational ongoing work and we call these queues. Um, we're gonna try and limit the kind of Airtable specific jargon, um, but it may, it may peek through. Um, so that includes accessioning, um, arrangement and description, uh, web archiving. Uh, currently our web archiving program is in a separate base uh, that allows us to handle um, the submission requests, the scoping, the the crawls and the quality assurance. Um, we use it to manage our cataloging and our offsite pickups as well. Um, and then in addition to our um, kind of operational work, we use it for analysis and tracking. So that includes things like um, individual archivist assignments, um, our annual statistics, and um, looking at that backlog. 
So we wanted to start out with an example of how we use Airtable together with ArchiSpace since there is some overlap um, the data and the systems. And there are places where we definitely don't want to be copying information over and over. Um, ArchiSpace is still our canonical source of data about collections. So we built our Airtable base by exporting a full resource record list with the titles, collection identifiers, and repository names um, from ArchiSpace, and we imported that into Airtable. Um, the call number, which is in the very left-hand side column of this view, is the primary key that links to work assignments in the accessioning and arrangement and description queues, as well as entries in our backlog table. And along the, the top of this slide, you can see the tabs um, that show the five tables that we have in our base. So accessioning, arrangement and description, um, backlog, and then we have master tables in the middle for all the call numbers and the archivist names. Um, previously, our queues for accessioning, arrangement and description, cataloging, and offsite were all separate Google Sheets. And if a collection went through one, two, or all three or four uh, workflow streams in a given year, it was impossible to look at this work holistically in the same document, and also really hard to confirm that everything that needs to be done was done. So uh, we took advantage of linked records from the call number list that we're looking at now, as well as a table of the archivist names to manage all the assignments in the department. And using linked records eliminates the need to re-enter the same information, and it also allows us to view all the work that happened to a specific collection, as well as the work a particular archivist completed in a given year. Um, we're going to watch a screencast that demonstrates the utility of the linked records um, and how each of the tables in the base relate. So first we're going to expand a record for the collection identifying information, which is pretty brief. It's just the data exported from archive space in the top three fields. Um, and then there are links to the other tables. Um, for the collection we're looking at, there's only an accessioning assignment link, um, but there would be links for the other two fields if they were present. Um, next, we're going to open the linked accessioning assignment um, from this full view that we have here, and we can look at the complete record of the assignment that shows the work that was done, when it was done, um, for an accession that was actually completed by Rachel. So the types of uh, data that we're recording about the assignments are the pre- and post-accession extents for all material types. Here we're seeing acquisition information that um, would be populated by the curators. This record happens to not have any. Um, and the fields that confirm all the work we expect to be completed during a typical assignment is in fact completed. Um, lastly, we record information about cataloging and sending the succession, which is now a new collection to our offsite facility. Um, and Rachel will talk more in detail about that in a minute. But from the accessioning assignment record, we can also jump into another linked record, um, which is the archivist name, um, to see all the work assignments currently linked across both the accessioning and the arrangement and description queues. Um, this is another really simple record that we created, similar to the call number that we just looked at. Um, we, we use it more for links to the work assignments than actually collecting data about specific archivists. So there's the linked records, and then we only have fields for the archivist name and a controlled value list for their role, like supervisor or processing archivist. Um, the white tether that I'm about to circle right now um, in both of these views uh, indicates that we're looking at a linked record rather than a record natively living in the table on the main screen. Um, and it's helpful just to know that you can edit a record in any view, whether it is linked or native. Okay, so we're going to walk through an example of how we use Airtable to document the work done in archive space, um, looking at a collection that we processed, cataloged, and sent off site. And using Airtable allowed us to integrate the management of all these steps in a single system uh, without repeating information again and again. Um, so just to give you a little bit of context, our cataloging and offsite workflows are connected. 
we export MARC records from archive space and load them into our ILS, OLIS, as well as OCLC connection. Um, we send some of our collections off-site, and the off-site facility we contract with has their own storage management system called Kyasoft. So the information um, about the boxes we send off-site gets transmitted from archive space to OLIS to Kyasoft. So um, we're gonna watch another screencast. So this is a screencast of um, the Robert Landy papers. And you can see this is the, the record in the arrangement and description table. Um, you can see how the record for the processing work um, about this collection, and I'm just actually demonstrating the link again to that call number, um, call number record. Um, so you can see uh, the record for the processing work about this collection um, is capturing information about um, the collection before it was processed, so the extent, um, as well as afterward. Um, it's also linked to the archivist who did this work. So uh, you, can, you can see all of the assignments that she's either already completed or are currently assigned to her. Okay, so you can see um, where the work, where in the workflow the archivist is um, through this current status feature, as well as when specific tasks like the survey or the processing plan were completed. Um, and so this helps us understand um, where exactly people are. Um, sorry, I need to pause. <laughs> um, so we have fields in the record. Um, that allow us to manage the cataloging and offsite workflows alongside the accessioning and arrangement and description um, work. So I just checked the checkbox called cataloging needed. Um, and now we're gonna close the record and move to a different view. Um, so we're switching to our cataloging queue, which is formed using a filter that says, you know, only include things where the cataloging needed box is checked. And the card layout makes it easy for us to work through this view. Um, and so this is the same record, but a lot of the fields from the earlier view are hidden in this one because we don't need all of these to do our cataloging work. So now that I've cataloged the collection, I'm going to deselect cataloging needed and select cataloging complete. Um, once I do that, you see that that card is no longer in this view. So we're moving to the next offsite pickup view. Um, it has a similar filter. Um, and again, it's all the same information, but this provides us with a manifest that we can use for our offsite pickup. Um, once we do that, we'll deselect it to make sure it's not included in the next month's pickup. Um, so we've moved to the completed view, so all the completed work for this year, which is managed through um, a filter based on the workflow status. And here, here, <clears throat> here is the record again. Um, lastly, if I wanna know how much we've sent off site in a year, um, I can go to this other view we set up just for that. Um, again, through a combination of filters. So um, the filters are the extent for off site field is not empty and that the pickup dates are between the first and last days of the academic year. So I can get that number very accurately and quickly. So we also use um, Airtable. One of the things we really like about it is that it allows us to communicate um, communicate uh, the status of the work that we do. Um, we want archivists, supervisors, and curators to be able to easily check in on the status of any current assignment. So in both our accessioning and arrangement and description queues, we added broad categories for the status of assignments using a single select field type um, that'll categorize these assignments by broad stages in the workflow from prioritized or ready for assignment to completed. And this provides an easy way for people to understand um, where things are in the pipeline and we can also use them to create some of those filters that you saw earlier. So in addition to tracking, um, the status field also allows us to sort assignments according to where each is in the workflow. We added a Kanban view um, stacked by that status field. 
Um, so everyone has an easy and quick way to view a particular assignment in the context of the current processing work. And we find this to be especially helpful for supervisors to see um, how many records are waiting for their approval. <coughs> Excuse me. So another feature that we've been using is the built-in form that enables uh, data submission in a more user-friendly format. So we're gonna watch an, an example of that. So this is the accessioning request form that curators fill out when they acquire new material. Um, and we do that to make sure that um, collections don't fall through the cracks. Um, that we can accession things as efficiently as possible and that we're sharing information along the way and not lose it. Um, the form is intended to be rather stripped down to record only the crucial information that we need uh, to create that accession record, um, like what this collection is, who donated it to us and when, um, and the curator can also point to um, other documentation that they have for the collection. Um, like a deed of gift or an inventory, um, and also tell us where that information lives so that um, we can access it and use it as we, um, as we do our work. So I'll just let this catch up to where I am. Okay, so um, this submission, it creates an individual record um, uh, accessioning assignment in the accessioning queue, um, which is great because we don't have to enter this information again. So you can see that all of the information that was put into the form is now in here. Um, and while you can create new records, you can create them directly in this sort of spreadsheet looking view. Um, it's definitely not as user friendly um, so we like the form for that reason, um, in addition to being able to kind of take fields out um, so that people only see what they need to. Um, so you can see that I assigned it a workflow status and I'm kind of walking through some of the steps in the accessioning queue. So again, um, the curators can look at this after they submitted the form to make sure that it got in there um, and as well as the um, where things are in the workflow. Okay, so I want to show you um, a quick example of um, I want to show you a quick example of how this helps us do our work in a way that's always building on a foundation rather than restarting from scratch. So here we can see um, this is that same accessioning request form a curator filled out about a new collection, um, including some great information about the content of that collection. Um, I would encourage you all to read it if you have the time. And so um, this same information um, about the donor um, and the date of collection um, is also in the view that the archivist doing the accessioning sees. Um, the information about the donor, the date of donation, um, and the summary of the collection goes into the accessioning queue or the accessioning record. So um, this is the record in archive space, and I would point to um, the accession date, the content description, um, and the provenance field in particular. Uh, the accession record is then spawned into a resource record um, in archive space, and again, that allows information to carry over rather than starting over. Um, so that content description field automatically gets turned into a scope and contents note. And then finally, that archive space record then becomes a public finding aid. Um, and you can see that the scope, of, scope and content note in this finding aid is very similar to um, what was in that description from curator field in the original accessioning request form. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about how we use archives, our Airtable to monitor our backlogs. Um, and when we talk about backlogs, we talk about both um, working backlogs, and then the more traditional, large, unaccessible collections backlog. Um, our working backlogs are really easy to track in Airtable um, after we set filters based on the current assignment status and then define some of the field types as numerical. 
um, that allows Airtable to automatically total um, those fields. It's circled at the bottom right corner of this slide. By keeping the status up to date in Airtable, the accessioning backlog is always accurate. Um, the information is first auto-populated when the curator um, fills out the form, as Rachel demonstrated, and then we're relying on structured data and filters of that data um, to keep it accurate. Previously, um, if we wanted to kind of get a calculation of the accessioning backlog, it was incomplete and it required compiling information from multiple sources and manual calculations. At the end of the year, um, the collections that are not open for research during accessioning are very easy to extract based on a field that we have um, that records whether or not a resource record from archive space was published, as well as the extent of the material that is not being described publicly, and the reason why the archivist or curator determined that more arrangement and description work was needed. And those are in controlled value lists, so you can see that um, this is a filter of all the completed accessions for the current academic year, um, and we have 63 records uh, totaling 83.55 linear feet that is technically going into the backlog. Um, collections that are not open for research are like this uh, list are one part of the larger backlog that I talked about, um, the undescribed one that is totally inaccessible to researchers. And as I mentioned at the start, while we want archive space to be our most uh, definitive source of information about our collections, as a whole, we're not able to extract granular information about unprocessed pockets of collections. Um, so since we migrated from Archivist Toolkit, we've recorded collection assessment data about every accession, processing assignment, and offsite shipment if it happened independently of the first two in a Qualtrics survey database. We use a rating system uh, based on the PAC goal consortial survey, but that also has limitations, especially when you're uh, surveying collections as a whole rather than individual accessions. So the ratings don't always meaningfully represent the needs of a collection that may be 95% processed by linear foot extent, um, but with a handful of boxes with different media types or that have specific needs for processing. In other words, um, the assessment data itself does require some analysis to translate back into simple data that will add up to a backlog. So as we um, assess our Qualtrics data and synthesize it, we add it to Airtable along with the newly accessioned collections that aren't open for research in a separate um, backlog table. We find it easier, again, to manage thousands of rows of data here where we can easily transfer basic information about the collections rather than adding this information into archive space collection management fields. Ultimately, we do want this data to live in archive space and we're paying attention to how the API and reports um, might be improved in the future to support not only recording the data but then being able to export it. For now, though, um, this information lives in Airtable, where it's used for large-scale prioritization and uh, setting and keeping track of assignments, which is what I will talk about now. Um, for accessioning, we're looking at like a really zoomed-in uh, screenshot of the accessioning table. Um, prioritizing is pretty simple. Um, this, this view is filtering down to all assignments that are not complete and collections are assigned and completed in the rough order they're received and recorded here, so top to bottom. Um, unless there's a priority status indicated um, by the curator on the form they fill out, um, the, next ready, the next collection that's ready for assignment will be the one someone takes, and we also know not to assign anything that hasn't arrived because uh, we wouldn't be able to do anything, um, or collections that are on hold um, because we are missing documentation. Um, arrangement and description priority order is based on collaborative decision making with our department ACM and the Special Collections Department. This year, our conversations about priorities were structured similar to Agile Sprints, where each curator brought a list of collections they wanted to see opened for research this year. And um, I provided estimates for how long processing would take based on the extent, the level of work requested, and other circumstances specific to the collection. 
The group then uh, reconvened and ranked the collections based on the estimates that I gave and keeping a rotation in place for everyone's picks so everyone kind of got equal representation on the board. Um, I then recorded the ranks that were assigned in a field, which is in the second column from the left of this uh, view we're looking at. It's shaded lightly in orange by Airtable. Um, and this view allows anyone to check in on how far we've made it through the priority list, and it gives archivists and supervisors an easy way to select new work based on basically what is numerically at the top. Um, we're currently wrapping up a building-wide collection survey, um, and once that's complete, I hope to have longer-term conversations about priorities beyond just one year's worth of work, and to keep that data into, in your table about like where every collection, accretion, or portion of collection falls on the priority list. That would really allow us to do much longer-term planning about our space, storage, and staffing needs, both in ACM and in the special collections. So the last thing we want to cover is how we use Airtable to compile statistics throughout the year and for our end of the academic year annual report. Um, in past years, compiling this information and analyzing it was very time consuming and prone to inaccuracies because we had to get information from multiple sources and do a lot of calculations through formulas or even by hand. So for the end of the year, we set filters uh, with, um, on the completion date of projects with, along with the field types for, um, for recording um, extents like linear footage and AV counts um, and born digital extents. Uh, we found that Airtable does a lot of the calculations for us. So the, um, this is a screenshot of the accessioning um, table in Airtable. Um, and we've created a separate view for all of the, the work completed in the academic year. Um, and we do this through a combination of filters. So um, we only want to see the records where the workflow status is complete and the ones that have a date finished value between the first and last days of the academic year. Um, you can see the arrows at the bottom point to built-in calculations for how many records are in this view along with a sum of the post-accession extent fields. And I've also added some additional groupings to identify um, how much of our accessioning we made accessible to users directly through this workflow. Um, so that's what the, um, the resource record published equals yes uh, value um, circled on top is. So uh, generally, um, we found that using Airtable to um, complete our statistics had a lot of benefits. Um, it allows us to get real-time counts. Um, so we do this by leveraging um, specific field types. So um, for example, using a number field rather than just a free text. Um, and this allows us to get those automatic calculations. Um, and then the, the form feature that a curator can use also uh, feeds into this by making sure that um, it's always up to date. Um, the filters and views themselves allow us to create a subset of data um, to make reporting statistics immediate and accurate. So um, that view that you just saw was used or was created based on filters. And um, again, leveraging that structured data and the linked records uh, really reduced the need for human calculations and the errors associated with it because of um, the automatic calculations the system did for us. Um, so we just want to end by uh, talking about a few of the lessons that we've learned um, having used the system for about a year. The first uh, is that um, we took several hours <laughs> over the course of uh, about three weeks to actually learn Airtable. Um, through the system documentation and tutorials and then build this database. People ask both of us a lot, like how to get a base up and running really quickly. And we think if you're actually gonna build a robust database or management tool, it's going to require a lot of time to both learn the structure of the system and then think about what you need to record and why. Um, but more specifically, um, like we, we think you should ac account for the amount of time that the learning curve takes um, and to really customize for what you need. Um, 
remember that you're creating a database and like any database, it requires thought analysis and time. Um, after our initial design phase, we have continued to make small modifications to our base along the way. Um, and it's helped to kind of iron out um, small kinks that we found and eliminate confusion with the field um, for the staff who use it. Um, Again, um, as Rachel mentioned, leveraging the specific field types that can be structured, like the single select, um, value lists, numbers, and dates, it helps enforce a data structure and prevents user error. Um, the real strength of Airtable is the fact that it's relational and um, it has database functionality. But if you're looking to clean up data, um, something like OpenRefine or Excel is, is really more suitable. Um, we had been using spreadsheets as databases previously, and it wasn't right for our needs. And we think similarly, if you're using a database when you need a spreadsheet, you might find similar frustrations. Um, we had better success importing from our existing, though imperfect spreadsheets, um, rather than starting from scratch. And by importing an existing spreadsheet, we could see where we actually needed to make modifications, like splitting information into multiple fields or constraining data by um, defining a field type. This surprised us because we could only really see the problems, um, but it helped us start somewhere. Um, and then we'll just kind of mention again that like the free version is easy to manage, but very limited in terms of the number of records you can actually store. The paid version gives you a lot more storage space, but it can be difficult um, either internally or with Airtable um, to get the nonprofit license. So um, that brings us to the end of our slides. Um, and we can turn it back over to SCA to moderate the questions for us. All right, thank you so much, Weatherly and Rachel. Um, we'd like to go ahead and move into a Q&A session with the presenters. I'm gonna bring up the slide that shows how to ask questions. Let's see, there we are. So uh, just a reminder, please post your questions through the questions box. And uh, Michelle, feel free to go ahead with any questions you've received. Yep, so we have a question now. Um, asking how intuitive did you find it as you were learning to use it? Um, I think I maybe just want to echo one of the points Weatherly made in that lessons learned slide about how we had so much more success um, importing from our existing um, spreadsheets that we're, we were using um, rather than starting from scratch. So that little screenshot of um, all our calendar appointments um, the first session didn't go super well, um, in part because we were trying to build from scratch and, um, and that made it really difficult to kind of map everything out. Um, but I think once you had something in place, like once we imported the spreadsheet that we already had, um, I think, and then by that point we had already kind of looked at some of the tutorials and documentation. Um, we did find it pretty um, pretty easy and relatively intuitive to make those modifications like, you know, adding new columns to record different information, um, changing something from, you know, a free text field to a date. Um, that was all pretty simple and intuitive to figure out how to do in the system. Um, some of the more some of the more complicated things like um, setting up the linked records, like the um, call number table and the archivist names table, um, that was maybe slightly less intuitive, um, but the documentation that uh, we found was um, very helpful and allowed us to get through it. Yeah, I think it, it's almost, um, if you don't yet know what you want, the, the very kind of visually, um, simple icons are, are deceptive um, because it, it it gives you an entry point without kind of holding your hand about how you actually want to be structuring things. So when we tried to build from scratch, we were putting all these structures in place on the data um, and then finding that we, we couldn't actually navigate it. So um, it, 
was much easier to not start from scratch. Um, and th figuring out how to link the records was maybe the most challenging part um, that we definitely had to go back again and again to the documentation. It wasn't like, you know, I was used to Microsoft Excel and it, it really wasn't like that. Yeah, and from the, um, maybe from like the youth side, from kind of um, all of our department using it pretty regularly, um, we definitely had a few points along the way where we wanted to clarify or make some minor tweaks, but we found that once we set it up um, and talked uh, talked our department through it, that most people found it um, pretty intuitive to use on their end in terms of um, you know easily understanding like how to select from a drop down list, you know what it means to check a checkbox and stuff like that. Um, most people found that a lot easier to um, work through than even some of the Google Sheets. All right, I'm going to ask uh, two quick questions in a row that hopefully can, you can answer at once. The first is, can you upload documents to it or just record what documents you've received? And then what format does Airtable data export as? Yeah, um, I can answer that. There is um, functionality to um, upload attachments. Uh, we don't use that just because um, there are limits to like the storage um, that are pretty it's pretty low. But you certainly can. You can upload images, like we showed in the um, the screenshot of how our preservation colleagues were using it. But yeah, you can also upload like PDFs or other documents and um, it's, oh, export. export, sorry. <laughs> um, and you can export, um, you can primarily export as a CSV, um, but you can also export individual records as PDFs if you want to do that. Thank you. Um, so the next question is, um, are the fields fully customizable? Um, Yes, I mean, I hope I'm answering the question correctly. Every field um, can be customized based on the, the options that Airtable gives. The only thing that is very um, kind of static, once you have a, a, a key in place, which is the first uh, column of any table, um, that can't change. Um, so that, regardless of whether it's a number, a date, um, a text field, it can't be changed. Um, the, the field type itself can't be changed. But um, I'm happy to clarify if, if I didn't answer the question. I think that's okay. Thank you. Uh, so was, was it difficult to get stakeholders on board and what kind of training was um, occurred along with this? Um, I don't think it was difficult to get people on board um, when we were, we you know, really went with the argument that like we need something similar to a relational database for the the number of collections we're working with in a year, and like we had constantly been hounding people to update the Google Sheets and hearing back very fairly that they were cumbersome to navigate and you could easily type over things accidentally. Um, we did um, initially. Rachel um, trained everyone and we because they, the the cues were based on our old spreadsheets a lot of the information was the same but we circled back after i think like two months and kind of refined some of the fields based on um things we were seeing people record and then when we had a new staff member join who um is the librarian for archival arrangement and description Anna mccormick she actually um came into the system completely new, not knowing how we did things before, and suggested that we write up like more specific documentation. So she's done that as well. Um, but I, it's generally not been a problem to get people up and running. Um, yeah. In terms of um, curators, was there uh, training for curators? Um, we haven't done any uh, formal or structured training. We've done a lot of sort of informal, um, you know, just like sitting side by side. Uh, with curators um, and in some ways there weren't a lot of 
it wasn't a radical departure. We had previous, so for the accessioning uh, workflow, um, <clears throat> I had previously been having curators fill out a Google form um, rather than an Airtable form. So um, those folks were already familiar with like the concept of recording information and sharing it via this kind of form structure. Um, so it was really more about um, clarifying the difference and why um, why this is what we're doing now. Um, but but we haven't really done much specifically beyond that. Um, all of our curators have uh, read-only permissions to our Airtable base um, with the idea that, you know, for accessioning, they can fill out a form and then confirm that it was received or confirm that they did, in fact, submit it, as well as um, see what that workflow status field is. I don't know if you want to say anything about arrangement and description. Um, yeah, I mean, the only interaction the curators were having, are having with the arrangement and description queue is to, to see where something is um, in the process. And um, it really hasn't been much of an issue. Again, we're not giving them right access to the data. That would be a very different conversation, and we'd definitely provide training in that case. Okay, um, we have a couple other questions lined up, so I want to uh, move on. We have two that seem to ask the same thing. Um, when you're talking about those Airtable accession records and then the accession records in ArchivesSpace, are you importing the Airtable accession records into ArchivesSpace somehow, or is that a manual process? So um, they're actually recording different information, to be clear. So the record in Airtable is about managing the accessioning workflow. Um, it has, it doesn't really relate to the accession record that's created in archive space. So the Airtable record, um, it has information that, that cur the curator submitted about, you know, what this is, when we got it, who gave it to us. Um, but it's primarily used and most of the content is to record, you know, who is this assigned to, um, What's the status of the accession record? Is it complete? Does it need revision? Um, same with the resource record to make sure someone did an assessment um, to record whether or not we published a resource record based on like through the accessioning workflow um, and then to record you know, the date someone finished it as well as if things are going off site, that information. Um, archive, in archive space, we're creating the accession record with archival description. So uh, we create a brief record um, with the core information, and then we also, as part of the process, um, either create or update that collection's resource record in archive space. So you know, we have a content standard that's based on DAX, and um, that's where we create and record our archival description on the collection. Um, we don't do that in Airtable we use Airtable to uh, track where things are in that process. I hope that makes sense. Yeah, and there there are a couple of fields that the information is the same, that doesn't get imported, it just gets copied yeah. between the Thank systems. You. Um, so do you, do you think this would still be worth implementing for a much smaller repository with fewer staff and a lower accession volume? Um, absolutely, if you are interested in, in understanding what actual capacity is for um, the work that you do and how long things take or, you know, like I, I'm not necessarily interested in tracking um, the amount of time assignments take to like police anybody. It's more like to set expectations externally for how long, you know, if you've got a certain extent or certain different types of material, like it gives us a really good understanding of how long that takes and how long to build in and being able to look back um, throughout the year and say like, oh, we were having a problem with this, but this other issue was also happening at the same time. Like it helps to contextualize a lot. Yeah, and I think, um, you know, we mentioned a few other uses for Airtable. Um, it's, it's really flexible as a tool. So there, there are a lot of different use cases that it might make sense for, and those don't necessarily have anything to do with scale. Um, one of the one of the things that it helps us with um, is, you know, 
when we record information in archive space and say, you know, collection X is, you know, 20 linear feet, um, that tells us what the extent is right now, um, but it doesn't, you know, tell us what maybe the extent used to be before it was processed or basically all of those other changes that um, occur when we work on collections. Um, and so, again, like we found Airtable to be really useful for um, helping us record, but also understand and talk about just like the work that we do in general um, in a way that wasn't anecdotal, that we could kind of quantify it in, in ways that were really helpful. Okay, thank you. We have a couple of questions left. I'm going to say if we don't get to them all, I will... Um copy these down so that I know what's left to ask and see if we can get that information out um, later. Uh, but the next one is, did you purchase a single seat for your institution or several for each power user? Um, we our license is based on the number of editing users. So it's, and it's tied to your individual um, like institutional email address. So it's, it's every user and for our department we're doing um, all the professional staff members and um, our student workers as well. Okay, and how do you collect and store more sensitive accession information? Hmm. Um, I guess I would maybe want an example of what that is. Um, so I think that's the reason that we use archive space as our collection management system. Um, is that and that we don't use Airtable for that reason, um, that we have more information security around our archive space instance. Um, yeah, I think that's, that's what I would say to that. Okay. Um, is there anything that you have tried to have Airtable cover that you found it could not do? What are some of the limitations you've encountered beyond that um, base storage for attach attachments? Ooh, that's a good question. Um, Nothing is nothing is coming to mind for us, but maybe we can jump to another question and think about that yeah. more. I mean, is it, well, okay, we did say like you can't clean data and it like that is not something it really supports at all. One, actually, I do have something. Um, something that we kind of pie in the sky would love is if um, different bases, so like different databases, different Airtable ba databases could talk to each other, um, which it doesn't seem like they can currently do that. Um, so our web archivist, she has a, a separate base for the web archiving program um, because it's a little bit more uh, kind of built out. Um, but it would be really great if that base could, you know, talk to ours so that um, when we accession those archived websites or process the collections that they belong to, um, that we could kind of link, link that information more easily. Great. Anything else? Thank you. Yes. Uh, so is there a way to add comments or notes to fields like in Excel or Google Sheets or Trello? Yes, there are, there are, um, it's, a, it's individual records. Um, so like we, when we did the screencast where we we're looking at kind of like a narrow um, long record, um, there's a comment feature where you both see the history of the edits and then you can leave comments and also tag other users um, in the comments. So it is very similar to the Google interface. Great, and if we have time, there's one last one. Do you ha ever have conflicting information in Airtable versus Archive Space? They share some of the same fields, so have you ever run into that issue? Um, I don't think so. I mean, it's it's usually pretty easy to trace back where the information came from in both systems because um, the edits are linked to individual um, individual user accounts. So you know, like the I think worst that we've encountered is like a typo. And because our um, so much of our base re revolves around what the individual collection identifier is, if you don't enter that correctly, um, everything's gonna be a little off, but that's also like happened, I wanna say one or two times, and it's been very obvious yeah. um, when it happens that we just need to correct it. 
Great, thank you. And that's it for all the questions we had. Okay. All right, thank you so much, Weatherly and Rachel, for taking the time to share insight into your strategies to improve workflow efficiencies at NYU Libraries. Um, and thank you all for taking time to participate in today's webinar. I believe a recording of this webinar will circulate with a follow-up email. Last, if you have a minute to spare, we'd really welcome your feedback through a quick survey that will pop up following this presentation. If you have any suggestions for our next webinar, please weigh in. Thank you so much.